welcome everyone. We'll give everyone a, a minute or two until uh, more people join us in. See a lot of people joining in right now. Wait just another moment for a few more people to join in. Wait just a few more minutes for those who just joined us in. A couple more receipts rolling in here. Well, as more people continue to stroll in here, it's uh, uh, two minutes after our start time, so I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so good evening, everyone. I'm Ryan Collette, the Chief Development Officer for the Pike Foundation, the fundraising arm of Pike Kappa Alpha. As you know, Pike University is the fraternity's premier leadership training platform that not only strengthens the leadership in our chapters, but helps build the next generation of men who will better their communities. The Pike Foundation sponsors this segment of the conference, the Leadership Lecture Series, where we ask prominent alumni to spend time with you, sharing their story and the impact Pike Kappa Alpha had on their lives so that you can learn from their experiences and use their practices to enhance your life. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Kara Zeman. Initiated in 1991 at Zeta Alpha Chapter at Kettering University, Harris led the fraternity as president, treasurer, and social chair. As an alumnus, he has continued to serve the fraternity as a former chapter advisor and now founder and president of the Zeta Alpha Alumni Association. He's also a generous donor to the fraternity as an active President's Council member, and his lifetime giving is in the Lily of the Valley Donor Society. Professionally, Harris is a partner and shareholder of Carney, a global management consulting firm with over 3,000 employees. Carney is a Chicago-based firm with a presence in over 40 countries, serving clients in automotive, consumer, retail, health, communications, tech, and public sectors. Harris specializes in providing strategic advice to automotive and industrial manufacturers and suppliers. In his 15 years at Kearney, he has served clients in areas of business strategy, performance improvement, and operations. Harris is a published leader in the auto sector on electrification, mobility, and advanced manufacturing. Harris graduated from Kettering University with two degrees, a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and in Electrical Engineering. He then earned his MBA at the University of Michigan. He resides in Detroit with his family. Harris is a shining example of a successful alum who took his skills to excel in his profession and better our world. I hope you all are as excited for his discussion as I am. During this presentation, if you have any questions or to interact, please use the Q&A feature. Feel free to ask questions along the way so we can have them teed up for Harris at the end. Brothers, please join me in welcoming our brother in today's leadership lecture, Harris Ng. Thank you, Ryan and Sam. It's uh, it's really a great honor to be speaking to everyone tonight. Um, you know, it feels like it was just yesterday that I was an undergrad Pike uh, sitting in your seats at a leadership conference like this, except uh, it was a real seat and not really on a Zoom. So, um, so glad to be here tonight and hopefully uh, everyone enjoys the talk um, and then also uh, learn something from this. Uh, 30 years ago, I woke up one night, uh, three in the morning. Uh, ready to start a new chapter in my life. I drove from my a humble little home in the suburbs of Chicago and really set off on a five-hour journey, something that would turn out to be the start of my, something much bigger. After arriving in Flint, I took a, a, a short nap in my car and woke to the hustle and bustle of a move into dorms. It was the first time for me on a college campus. 
I was a child of immigrants with no, uh, and my parents had both had no high school degrees. I was not the oldest child in my family, but I was the first one going to college. So as I went through this orientation weekend with everything that was uh, new to me, uh, one of the first, the very first people I met uh, was, was my RA. He was big, he was tall, energetic, and he was a pike. So for all those out there that are uh, uh, volunteering as RAs, uh, keep it up, right? Because it's an important rush tool. So, um, you know, as, as I settled in, into this uh, new place, new town, uh, I really took advantage of my time at Kettering. Uh, I ultimately rushed and pledged the Pike House. And then through the years, I was active, as, as Ryan was saying. I was active on campus and also on the, uh, in the chapter. On campus, I was also the, uh, very involved in Student Center for many years and ultimately was the uh, Student Center president. So if you think about it, the trick of all of that, which is all the activities with the fraternity, ultimately being the SMC, the Student Senate uh, President, and then also uh, balancing the, the, my dual degree in mechanical and electrical engineering. You know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, was it really worth it for all the effort? You know, it was, it was a lot of work, a lot of nights uh, up studying, you know, probably sacrificed probably more social time than I, than I uh, wanted. But as I look back in that life, right, there's always times and points in your life where you kind of know it really defines you. And for me, it was really those college years. And it was, the Pikes were a big part of it. So to go from this underachieving high school student that I was before, right, to a student leader balancing a heavy academic load, it really built my self-confidence that really serves my, as my foundation today. And I've always found that the hard work and service that you give to others always pays back. So today I am a partner at AT Kearney and you know, our, our firm is not a household name. So I know many of you are probably furiously Googling uh, AT Kearney right now and trying to figure out what our firm does. Uh, we are a management consulting firm. And everyone always asks me, what is a management consultant and what do we do? And, and it really is the hardest thing to explain. Our industry spends a lot of time and effort recruiting the top MBA and undergrad programs. You know, they're out there, there are books, YouTube videos, websites, all dedicated uh, for students trying to get into management consulting. And even those students, like I spend so much time on, uh, on campuses recruiting uh, for our kind of junior consultants and even all those students that are out there on campus that kind of have this dream of being a management consultant, it, it's really hard to explain to them what we do. So what do we do? And I'll try to explain it to you here tonight. One is it's, uh, it's about client service. It's about client relationships. It's about uh, business strategy. It's about uh, performance improvement. You know, we, we are really a professional services business that are hired guns for business executives. We help senior executives deliver on their promises. These are typically global Fortune 1000 CXOs or senior VP type clients, or they could even be private equity owners of companies. Now, I think that the best way to try to describe uh, what we do is maybe give you some examples of the type of work we do. You know, one day we could be doing a big uh, commercial due diligence uh, where we're trying to understand the market uh, of a company that a private equity uh, wants to buy. And we need to assess the market growth opportunities or their competitive position. Another day we may be doing a market entry strategy for an overseas uh, a company that wants to enter the US market. Sometimes we're just working on an operations improvement project, trying to help uh, an industrial company serve their customers better by improving their supply reliability. And then sometimes we're working with companies to just look at cost reduction. It's, it's actually a big part of our job. A lot of people want cost reduction, uh, improves the margins quite a bit. So those are the type of things that we do. We have consultant teams, um, some, some are newer grads, MBAs, undergrad, and, and we work in project teams that go out and deliver on those projects. 
So as you think about your future careers, consulting can be either a stepping stone. So some people spend just a few years in the business and then move on into industry, or it could be a lifelong career. Um, you know, I've been with the firm for 15 years now, and uh, it's probably going to be, uh, you know, my kind of career as we go forward. So it's, um, it is a tough and uh, competitive interview process, uh, and it takes a lot of preparation. But as anything in life, right, if, it, if it's challenging, it is a real growth opportunity. So for all those that are considering management consulting in the future, just uh, a little bit of uh, uh, overview there. Now, so I've been with uh, Cardi now 15 years, and through all that experience, uh, I found a few leadership secrets that I've learned. And, uh, you know, going from that underachieving high school student uh, to where I'm at today, you know, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think are important. And I think there's four things. One is uh, develop self-motivation. The second is challenge the status quo. The third, learn persuasive communication. And then the fourth, find success with people. So this, uh, the first one is develop self-motivation. You know, I, I think there are, there are always days where sometimes you wanna binge watch the Ozarks on Netflix, or maybe you're determined to finish a few more missions on AC Fahala. You know, we're all human and sometimes we just wanna sit around and do nothing or uh, something that's not that productive. However, successful people will always find ways to motivate themselves. The question is how do you pick yourself up and go and accomplish something? How do you get the drive every day to do something without being told what to do? You know, all through your life, uh, up through now, you've, there's a tremendous amount of structure in your life. You're, you're told when to go to school, what assignments you need to get done. Uh, you know, life until now has been planned. You know, even in college, you're kind of told the classes or credits that you need to, uh, to, to get accomplished to graduate, right? But as, as you kind of move into your career, uh, there, there's a lot of independent self-motivation that's going to be important. You know, I think the, the college years, uh, you know, it's a transition where it's a little bit of structure, but then a whole bunch of independence as well. And think about this as your training ground. And we all go through our ups and downs, and I think that's why the self-motivation is pretty important. You know, it's okay to feel a little lazy every once in a while, but find ways to constantly motivate yourself. And everyone's a little bit different, so you have to kind of find your own way to do it. I like to have a few phrases that I tell myself to keep myself going. You know, one of my favorites is, I didn't wake up today and dream of being in second place. You know, it's those type of things that you kind of can float in your head and just keeps you pushing ahead. The other is uh, you can also find intermediate goals or milestones ahead. You know, from the time that you were born until kind of where you're at now in, in, in college, there's always been milestones, right? You do a year of school, you graduate kindergarten. That's over, you start all over in elementary school. And then you graduate fifth grade, right? You're happy, you start all over in sixth grade. You know, start from the bottom, you work away, your way up and all of a sudden you're the biggest kid in, in middle school and you graduate there. Then you start over as a freshman in high school and you graduate high school. And now hopefully you'll graduate college, right? As you kind of move through those four or five years. And all of those different things take about four or five years to do, right? So they're, they're in relative to life, they're short bursts of time that you have to achieve something. And once you get out of college, it's very much different, right? You don't want your final goal to be a retirement because that's a long ways away, 35 years, right? So somewhere in between, you have to figure out what are these intermediate goals and achievements you can have and think about the things that you can do six months out a year out things that you can set your mind to and then try to accomplish so i've actually been a distance runner for a few years now uh, not an elite athlete but uh, you know fairly impressed with myself and what i've been able to do uh, when i started running I was running about three or four miles a day, you know, probably five years ago, and I'd run a half marathon uh, race a few times a year. Uh, then, then one year I decided to run a marathon, right? Uh, but I didn't properly train for it. And leading up to the marathon, the longest I had run 
was the 13 miles in a half marathon. So if you can imagine going from 13 miles to 26 miles was very tough. And it's as much uh, mental as it is physical. So what I did, uh, I told myself, aside from I'm not gonna do that again, I'll properly train next time, was I actually uh, set goals for myself in three mile increments. You know, every three miles, I was trying to accomplish the three miles and then I'd reset and then do another three miles and reset. And all those intermediate goals just keeps you moving until you get to your final goal. So figure out how to develop self-motivation. You'll have a long career ahead of you. You need to continue to push yourself. So these little intermediate goals or milestones kind of help with that motivation. So this, the second thing was uh, challenge the status quo. And this is really an interesting one. I spent a lot of time as a consultant working in different client and companies. And my entire, entire job is to drive change. So no client ever comes to us and says, uh, here's a multi-million dollar consulting project. Please don't change my company dramatically. Make it comfortable for us, right? No one ever says that. It's actually the quite, quite the opposite. And our entire job is to drive change. And typically the incumbents, the ones that are there today, right, are the ones doing the jobs every day that are resistant to change. They always find ways to rationalize the resistance. Right, and, and I've always thought a lot about why people are resistant to change. You know, they're not bad people. A lot of them have a very good motivation. You know, a lot of them are hard workers. But, but what I found is that it's really a risk aversion. It's maybe a little bit of fear of the unknown. It's also that many of them are punished more for failure than for success. So making progress improvements requires you to ask the hard questions and challenge the status quo. Challenge the assumptions. Don't let people find ways to say no. And we have to learn how to be uncomfortable and grow. So many of you uh, probably competed in sports in high school or even now in, uh, in college. And we all know uh, that to get better physically, you have to strain yourself, right? You go work hard. Uh, do a workout, you get uncomfortable in practices, and these workouts make us sore and tired. Afterwards, we get some rest, re recover, and we get stronger and faster. So that same model of challenge of the status quo and fighting through change and discomfort of change is, is really your workout. You have to make it a practice so that you continue to challenge yourself to go do that. It, the more and more you do it, the better you'll, you'll be at it. Uh, the third thing was, uh, that's a leadership secret is learning persuasive communication. I'm sure most of you have great ideas. There's never a shortage of great ideas. However, you can be the smartest person in the room with the greatest ideas, but unless you can convince others to do or think differently, your brilliance is go unrewarded. To do big things in life, you really require leverage. It's only one person, you can only do so much by yourself. That's why we always talk about teamwork. It really takes leverage of a team of people to be able to do something big, bigger than just yourself. And the only way to do that uh, and do it more and be able to influence what the team is doing, whether you're a formal or informal leader in a group, is to be able to bring others with you. So the power of persuasive language and communication is critical, critical to that. I always think that persuasive communication, uh, I always think about it in a few ways. First, uh, know your audience and what they think is important to them. To understand their motivations and perspective always helps you shape your message. Second, have a crisp rationale on, on why they should believe in what you're saying that addresses what they know is important. Right, this one, this one I think everyone gets. However, the crisp part is important. Right, put focus on the issue and the argument. You know, make sure that it's super clear in terms of what you're trying to say. Finally, the most important part of it all in terms of persuasive communication is that even before you start the communication, you have to have built the credibility and trust so that they believe you. And this is really a process that takes time and investment. 
many times we're not uh, we're not working with strangers, right? We've worked with people in the past, and we're trying to persuade them. So before uh, they actually work with you, or before you have some some uh, persuasive discussion with them, they're going to have an image of you and your reputation, and that has to be built over time. So learning persuasive communications really uh, will allow you to build and lead the teams effectively. And then the final one, and I think this is uh, the, the most important one, is really, and it builds on the, uh, the whole idea of persuasive communications with people, is you also have to uh, find success with people. And this, this final leadership secret is probably not a secret at all. So every single one of you out there uh, has already recognized the importance of people and social networks, right? We're all members of a fraternity. So, you know, as I said, we're, li we're limited to in what one person can do, and you have to have leverage. And humans are social beings. We have to build the social skills to be likable and friendly to a lot of people. And it's with that likability that leads us to be able to find success with others. You have to build a network of people over time, and you should maintain the network. I think a lot of people, what happens is they may meet people or they may know people, but relationships also grow stale. And, and keeping that network uh, refreshed and maintained is pretty important. I, I would say that, uh, and, and even so in our business, relationships uh, really matter in this world. Clients don't hire us, right, unless they trust us in management consulting and think that we can deliver for them and treat their organization right. So our relationship with those executive decision makers is many times what decides if we get a project or not. Most of our work is built on relationships and networking with executives, right, in our industries, in the corporate world. So remember to build your network and maintain them. Continue to reach out and stay connected with people throughout your life. And over time, you realize that those relationships will pay off in many ways. So just to wrap up and, and one reminder, uh, make sure you're going in the chat to record any questions that you may have, um, and, and we can have a good dialogue after this. Um, but to close, you really have a tremendous opportunity in front of you. Right, you have the years of schools, uh, you, have, you have maybe a few years of school left where you can be leaders on your campus and your chapter. You know, treat these years as practice for your future careers. Take the leadership secrets, developing the self-motivation, challenging the status quo, learning the persuasive communication, and finding success with people. You know, go, you know, this, uh, the 20 minutes I'm gonna talk is not gonna make you an expert, right? Go learn more about them, practice them while you're on campus, within your chapters and your roles within your chapter. And use that as a really a learning ground so that when you graduate, you know, you may be a little tired, you may be a little sore, but you're gonna be stronger and faster at leadership, just like your workouts. Just remember the more you practice, the better you get. So with that, we'll, uh, Ryan or Sam, we, we can take the questions. Excellent, thanks Harris. Really appreciate those uh, words of wisdom for us today. Yeah, as you have questions for Harris, please, Enter those into the Q&A, and then we'll uh, answer it from there. Um, our uh, the brothers from Zeta Alpha, uh, shout out and say hi. They're they're watching together. So um, Alex said uh, said hi, and thanks for uh, participating today. Um, yeah, happy to see everyone, or at least know you're out there. I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> now, here, since you were talking, a lot of things that you were saying really uh, made me you know put my hat on as an undergraduate to think. You know where I'm at in my journey as a college student and where I want to get to and um, I like your point about mentioning that don't just look at the end goal but making the midway goals in between um, and I think for a lot of our chapters they look at it as oh yeah we want to win this tonight's award the excellence award or this award with the headquarters um, but but that advice is say yeah set the long-term goal but what are some intermediary steps that you can take in between to do that um, and so I think the, the approach that you have from a consulting standpoint would really be helpful for a lot of our chapters where, you know, once a year, a lot of times our consultants come in and visit with them and give them at one point advice on what to do, but then what could a chapter do with that report, with that information to really build upon that and to use some of the consulting techniques that you utilize so that way they're, they're continuously building upon it, not just taking that 
one time snapshot in the year and then letting it go away? Yeah, I think um, a couple things, right? One is um, the big thing is accountability, right? I, I think, uh, and, and probably it's, it's accentuated in college, right? Like we all like to procrastinate, it's, it's human nature. Right, so uh, we really have to find ways to hold ourselves accountable, right, to achieving things. So I think that's the first thing, right? Like, don't, uh, you know, I, when we look at uh, these type of plans or, you know, these goals, right, a lot, a lot of times it's, um, you know, all the, the consultants arriving next week, let's start looking at you know, what happened last time, right? Um, so we always, after, um, you know, I think the best thing to do is have, a real chapter meeting and discussion, right? In terms of what that report says and what it really means. And the, the chapter should be, uh, one is they have to uh, convince themselves that they're bought into that, right? And, and hold themselves accountable to it. So I think that's one, right? And, and if they're accountable to it and energetic about it, right? I think that's, uh, that's a great start. Then I, uh, the second thing is really, it's around planning and milestones, right? And it ties back into the accountability because if, if you can uh, take that work and create smaller chunks of it, it's much more manageable and it's something that uh, you can accomplish, right? And then uh, wh whoever is leading that plan, whether it's the SMC or whoever else in, in the chapter is responsible for it, right? They can hold the teams accountable for kind of intermediate goals. And then, then you kind of know where, uh, whether or not you're making progress. You know, I think um, the important thing about any type of change is uh, they can't be um, kind of discrete events. It really has to change your way of thinking, right? It's a continuous improvement mindset. What else can I be doing better? And uh, it's not a you know, once a year, let's uh, look at these things, right? It's, uh, we should always be asking ourselves, what can we be doing better? Thanks for that, Eric. Um, had a couple more comments from uh, some of the Zeta Alpha B members. Uh, uh, appreciate your talk uh, from Jacob. And uh, Josh Woods, actually from Zeta Alpha B, asked, uh, any recommendations on good rush strategy, recruitment of events or strategies, uniqueness? Um, you know, maybe something from your, persuasive communications, anything from that that you would recommend as it relates into working with recruits? Yeah, so um, what's funny is uh, in our business, uh, in management consulting, it's very, it's services business, right? So the, uh, the quality of people that we hire is actually uh, shapes kind of the quality of our firm, right? So we, we invest a lot in uh, recruiting. Uh, on college campuses. In fact, um, you know, we, in, we spend a lot of time on campus, um, you know, with the recruits. We have a lot of, you know, coffee chats, meetings, uh, you know, presentations. It's actually very much like Rush, right? But much more uh, professional, uh, probably not the same type of events, right? And I think there's, uh, it's a couple things, right? One is um, from a Rush standpoint, the better you, uh, you target, and this is uh, how we do it in the recruiting, right? The better you target, the better you can um, uh, put resources towards the people that you are really prioritized, right? And, and I think that's that's an important part, right? Because, uh, you know, in the end, your, your chapter is only, uh, resources are only so much, right? And you really have to say, okay, uh, if these are the type of people I want, or these are the names, and we actually have a funneling process, right? That that um, you know looks at and collects a whole bunch of names and people and why we like them, and then our whole job is to get them to our events, talk to our uh, consultants through the whole process of recruiting. You know, in the end, when when it comes down to interviews, right? They have to survive the interview process and prove themselves, right? But what it does is it really feeds the right amount of people into the process and the funnel. So, so I think it's having that process, uh, having the focus on uh, identifying the right people and, and, you know, you have to actively pursue them. And I think it's very much like Rush. That's awesome to hear. It's, uh, it's neat to see how much what we're training our undergraduates on doing in recruitment and those strategies 100% translates over to what you're now doing professionally. Those skills that even you participated in as an undergraduate are now being used today. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Like uh, we even, we do, because uh, we, we typically would hire summers or interns, right, that are, uh, you know, rising seniors or, or, you know, graduates, right? But we actually do a lot of work with students even before that, right, to like uh, start creating the, the visibility in the funnel, right? Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of the same way as uh, what, you know, from a rush standpoint, right, you, you're kind of doing the student orientation, right? Getting your pikes out there, wearing the letters. So it's, it's very much the same. It's, it's human nature, right? You're, you're trying to um, have the best chance of attracting the type of people that you want. Cool, yeah, I, I can completely see the ties into what we talked about with the 365 recruitment and uh, going after men, whether or not you can give them the bid right then and there or you can hire them. Um, you still want to make that relationship and be building that up so that way you can deliver that, that bid at the right time. I love it. Yeah. Similarity. Um, another question that came through was uh, from Michael asking, how do you use obstacles to drive personal and professional growth? What obstacles did you face as an undergrad that influenced your development? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, the you know, I think the, the biggest thing from a undergrad standpoint, I, I'm not going to, like, I think it's a lot less like one particular obstacle, but I think the whole, uh, I was um, super involved in, in school, right, uh, to a point where, um, you know, I was pretty stretched calendar-wise and, and uh, time-wise, right, and it's very hard to balance, right, all the different things that were going on. Um, you know, and, and I think a lot of other college students aren't like that, right? Uh, but I would say, like, what I did in college is very, actually, very close to what I have to do now, right? Between balancing uh, my family life, uh, work life, and then also all these volunteer opportunities, right, and that, that I'm involved in. So if you think about, uh, you know, taking those challenges on um, while you're at school, right? it's really, uh, it's a training ground for when you come out, right? So the, the better you can uh, kind of learn and practice all that in school, um, you come out and you can be much more successful. And I think even as, as, um, as we talk about recruiting for, from a consulting standpoint, like our, uh, what we look for are those, those type of people, right? That are stretching themselves, uh, that are putting them, themselves in kind of difficult, challenging situations. You know, I think when, when you can, if you are good at handling stress and kind of a problem and solving them and kind of persevering, right, you get better with it, with over time. That's great. Yeah, and I, I definitely would say that, uh, you know, our students are likely seeing one of the most unique obstacles ever in their time right now doing with the, the COVID crisis that's going on right now. Are, are there any unique strategies or things that you would recommend for them in overcoming this obstacle or ways that they could challenge the status quo or continue to persevere through it? Anything unique that you would want to add there? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. Um, I think on, on a couple uh, realms, uh, right? One is, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're very, we're social beings, right? And, um, and I think, uh, you know, I actually, normally my day-to-day -day life, I'm um, traveling most of the week, right? Don't know where I'm at. Like I, client to client, probably every couple of days I'm going to a new client, right? Uh, you know, have, uh, I'm probably, I'm 80,000 miles from 2 million miles lifetime in Delta, right? So, so I, I rack up a lot of travel and we're, we're constantly this, this dynamic kind of nature of the business, you know? Um, is exciting. It's, uh, you know, talking to people, different people, kind of solving problems. And then all of a sudden, right, we're kind of stuck here at home, standing, you know, staring in front of a screen. Um, you know, COVID has kind of taken out a lot of that. And I think one, one of the biggest things I think uh, for us personally that we can do is, right, like stay connected to people. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's an important part of it. Um, to be able to survive kind of the, this COVID piece. I think, uh, so that's personally, I think that's pretty important. I think organizationally, right, we, 
we don't know kind of what this is going to look like. If, you know, if you would have asked me in April of last year, right, how COVID was going to end, you know, I would have said, yeah, we're going to lock down for two months and then everything will spring back open and we'll be okay, right? So here we are, right? We're, we're uh, probably six weeks away from a full year of doing this, right, of varying degrees of lockdown. And I think the uh, one is we got to, like, I think the best thing to do is figure out how to be resilient, right? Like, so make a plan, like, figure out how to survive uh, tough times. Um, so, you know, don't, uh, you know, I think a big mistake a lot of people have is, uh, you know, they could be too optimistic about kind of what could be happening, right? So what I would do is, as a fraternity, right, chapter, right, look at your finances, make sure you're kind of buckling down and, um, you know, having a plan to survive, kind of ride it out. It's a crisis management plan. That's, that's a great, uh, great point about the crisis management plan and uh, is that, that environment we're in. Do you ever believe that we will go back to the way things were, or do you think that we've now ventured into sort of a, a new normal and that there will now be enhanced, you know, virtual communication models will be enhanced work from home. Yeah. Um, you, mm -hmm. how, how do you think that our students that are you know, in the fraternity with their experiences right now are really going to impact and make them hopefully even more successful um, as professionals since they're now going through this while they're in a more safe space in a learning laboratory in a fraternity? Yeah, and actually our, our firm does a lot. We, we do publish a lot of um, papers and thoughts around you know, the new normal. Um, and and I, I would say a couple things, right? I think everything that's going to stick would have happened, but would have happened over a longer period of time, right? What won't stick are things that probably would have never happened in the first place, right? So I think the fact that we don't have uh, kind of the face-to-face -face communication, I think the, the mix of, um, you know, what you do face-to-face -face versus virtual, right, is going to change. But there's always going to be a big element of face-to-face -face that needs to happen. I think the uh, the rise of kind of e-commerce, uh, e, e anything, right, is, is going to increase, right, uh, and the technology has to kind of catch up with it in certain areas. Um, but I think that's here to stay, right. I think the frictionless idea of you know everything in life should be easier to do with technology. Um, you know, that's, that's just, uh, we want that and we're going to get it. Yeah, I think, I think what you said there really resonates with uh, the point you mentioned about challenging the status quo, because ultimately our, our chapters have an opportunity to be uh, pioneers and trailblazers. Of the, you know, no one's ever done this before in fraternity. And, you know, if they can come up with the next best idea to better operate, to do things, they could easily make themselves uh, the premier fraternity or campus extremely quickly or do something that's extremely innovative. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that, that ability to uh, uh, challenge the status quo, but then also the persuasive communication of, you know, what's your advice for that sophomore freshman who's coming in and saying, hey, I've got a unique idea, um, and uh, but how do I get buy-in for that? That was one of the things that, that Alex questioned was, you know, maybe I've got a specific idea. How do I use that persuasive language um, to then persuade the chapter or my business later on, um, especially some of those younger guys who may not be in a leadership position, um, how can they use some of that persuasive language and how can they uh, still make an impact there? Right, and I think this is where, uh, when I was um, talking about it, it's a lot of times when you're communicating with people, it's not the first time, right? And the, the best way to start it is actually uh, predates that, like when you want to say it it's not that moment of time when you're trying to say something that's important. It's actually everything that led up to it as well. Because if you've proven yourself as someone who can contribute, who's reliable, who's credible, who's, you know, smart, um, who's thinking about things, right? All of that shapes uh, your reputation within people, right? So when, when you speak, right, that persuasiveness, regardless of the exact words that you say, Right, is, is, it's going to be more meaningful um, than if you know, oh, so and so doesn't, they don't do their duties or whatever, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so so if if you if you're the type of person that is um, 
you know, you have to prove yourself to kind of get to that point. I guess that's, uh, that's maybe the most important point. And then when, when we talk about actual persuasive communication, I think one is practice. Like you, you have to kind of get used to, to speaking to people and to audiences in total, right? And you have to learn how to put the problem into focus and be really concise about what you're trying to say. I think the conciseness and focus is pretty important. You know, a lot of times there's an ongoing joke, uh, you know, that consultants kind of take your own data and just show it back to you, right? Um, that's always a, a big joke, right? But, but the difference is consultants put it in a perspective in a way that puts the problem in clear focus, right? So that it's super sharp and easy to see. And that's, that's the value of the persuasiveness. Very nice. Had a, another question come in. Um, how did your leadership roles in the chapter prepare you for your career? From Michael. How did leadership roles in the chapter prepare you for your career? Yeah, I, I, I think that's um, generally, right? I, I think the, the more you do, uh, the more you get out of it. Right? I think what, what happens is, um, you know, any type of service uh, to, to anything, right? I think there's, uh, there's, there's this ability like to serve, like for, the fraternity is a great example, right? Because all, it's, uh, it's all volunteer, you don't have to do it, you don't get paid to do it, right? Um, and and the, when you serve, right, uh, you get so much back from it uh, in terms of growth and development of you as a person. Right, everyone, and I see this a lot, right? Because we recruit all these uh, uh, big schools uh, and big, especially the MBAs, right? Because they pay so much for tuition, and uh, they all come out. They want to run the world, right? But like, um, uh, be the next CEO tomorrow, right? But but through that, like before you ever get there, right? You have to pay your dues, and you have to learn and understand, right? And um, you know, I, I viewed kind of all of my time back in uh, undergrad, you know, all my different leadership roles is all kind of learning uh, places to where I'm at now. Very nice. Yeah, that, that, that rolls into another question um, about in the, what our students are doing as undergraduates. And, you know, I'm thinking about for the majority of our students, who may want to go in the field like consulting. It's, mm -hmm. like none of the classes they're taking are really uh, the intro to consulting or whatever that might be or the preface to it. And, and I'm assuming a lot of it's going to be on the job training and development. And so when you're looking at from a hiring standpoint, like what are some of the main things when you're looking at a, a college student that, you're, that just, just wow you, that either make you say, yeah, this is something that we want to bring on staff or what are some, of, on the flip side, what are some of the things that maybe you see uh, a student doing that just completely turns you off and saying this this is not the type of person that we want or they don't have these certain skills or characteristics qualities what what are some of those main things you're looking for and what are some of the main things that really turn you off right um so i think one thing right is um is problem solving so a lot of uh, kind of what we do is problem solving and a lot of it is driven by analytics and data right so if if you think about what we're uh, asked you a lot of times there are kind of big company problems that everyone kind of gets uh, has a little bit of feeling for what's wrong right a lot of times it's like they, it's an opinion right a lot of times what we do is we take kind of a lot of different information right and be able to do the analytics and synthesis right to really say okay here's your real problem and then based on that here, here's how you you solve it right so what we look for, um, you know, you know, high intelligence, of course, but uh, a lot of it also is like uh, analytics problem solving. Mm -hmm. So we, we pull people out of engineering degrees, uh, out of uh, industrial engineering, other engineering, right? Or even if you're non-technical, right? Uh, a lot of people that can, can demonstrate some of the analytics and the, the problem solving behind it. So I think that's one piece of it. Another one really, uh, is around as we talked about like this these interpersonal skills 
because in the end, it's all about um, client service, uh, right? So the, at the partner level, right, we're, we're dealing with uh, kind of the more executive clients, right? The ones that are kind of have the, the bigger uh, question, the ones that hire us, right? And then um, even our um, consultant teams, right? They're interacting with clients every day, right? And they're talking to them day in, day out. They're trying to relate to them and try to get information and you know, try to understand the business so uh, you really need a lot of uh, very strong kind of uh, interpersonal skills to be able to do that. Yeah, I completely agree with the, uh, the point about the interpersonal skills. Um, I think that's definitely an area that uh, it's really hard to, to teach and it's more of something that you learn and something you experience. And uh, I think a lot of that can come about by being in the fraternity and the experiences you have within it. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, social skills are important in life. To, you don't. You only open doors when you're likable. That's a great point. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to to add those into the chat feature as well too. Um, we have a few more minutes uh, with Harris. Um, see, Sam, did you have any uh, questions on yours that you'd like to ask or anything right now? I have no questions, but I just got to tell you, Harris, this was great. Um, it's always interesting, inspiring to be able to hear from someone who's not only done so much in their career, but has had a positive fraternity experience and uh, been able to give back and make a different impact on it too. So um, I think this has been some great words, some great insight that we all needed to hear tonight. So thank you for your time here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think we have three minutes left. Harris, is there any uh, concluding um insights thoughts anything you want to share with the men uh, you know any any final life lessons or thoughts or anything uh you'd like to conclude with yeah no i, I think uh just you know we have a, a pretty decent crowd out there i think uh one thing to keep in mind right is uh fraternity service is important right i think it's it pays off long term uh, i think the the more you put into it the more you get out of it um and i think it's um it's one of those that as you think about kind of your years past college, right? Um, this is the type of investment, right? That you need to do today uh, to be able to be successful in the future. Excellent. We, we did have actually one more uh, question come in. So uh, from Benjamin, thank you for sharing. Sure. We do have time for another one if anyone else has one more as well. But his question is, you mentioned the importance of building and maintaining a network. What is one part you found to be easy and one difficult strategy for maintaining a social network? Yeah, I think the, the easy part is meeting people, right? So a lot of people, like you meet a lot of people in your life. The hard part is really uh, staying connected to them, keeping the uh, connection warm. And uh, because a lot of times uh, what you, your, your call that, you know, if you haven't talked to someone in five years, right? You, you that call that first call to them back to that person is that you, you don't want to ask for something <laughs> right so so what you want the, the best relationships have kind of a, a constant back and forth that kind of uh, maybe it's not consistent maybe it's sporadic but there's there's some back and forth over time right and then at some point uh one either they or you have you know some need that that other person can help with Right, and that's like when the kind of uh, the, the warm back and forth is continuing to happen, you know, that's the hardest, that's, uh, it's much easier to, to, to be able to use your network in a way. Um, and the hard part is maintaining it, right? It's just, it's, uh, there's, you know, you meet a lot of people in your life, right? And some people just, uh, you just can't keep up with, so. Excellent. Thank you for that question. And uh, another question came through from Alex. Um, or Alex. What are some good ways to encourage members to step up both in the leadership positions or in the chapter and on campus? So actually motivate your brothers to step into roles in the fraternity and uh, in the campus as well, too. Yeah. Um, so campus, campus leadership is important, right? Because I think it builds brand and uh, credibility of the chapter on the campus, right? Uh, the, the best people aren't there, aren't gonna be like, uh, you know, wanna, the, the overachievers aren't gonna go wanna rush the, uh, the slackers, right? So, 
people, and, and it's just like uh, in our consulting business too, right? Like you, you put forth your best people because uh, the recruits, they, they want to be the person that they see you know, out there, right? So uh, it's that role model. It's like as a freshman, right, I see the student body president you know, I, I as the freshman want to be that person at some point, right? So, so that's where, um, you know, from a fraternity perspective, uh, campus leadership is important in, in holding kind of those uh, positions of power, authority, whatever you want to call it, right? Because I think it just, it creates this role model status uh, that, that's important and that can uh, build in, in rush. Just like for, for us from a consulting standpoint, like uh, as a partner, I have to go speak in all these uh, college campuses, right? Because, you know, hopefully someone wants to be like me, like, oh, so-and-so is a partner, right? Like, so, so that's, uh, you need to kind of build that, uh, that, that view like, oh, you know, so-and-so would be a great role model. And, and when that happens, right, they will follow along. Excellent. Yeah, and the, um, and as you mentioned that, I'm sure that, especially within your field with, uh, not to be judgmental in engineering, but I'm sure that some of the social skills are not as prevalent amongst uh, a lot of people in the engineering field. And so um, having your ability to be more social and to have the interpersonal relationship skills, uh, do you think that that helped you to advance your career? Yeah, well, if I would have stayed in engineering, right, then uh, probably a great engineering uh, mm -hmm. You know skills and the interpersonal probably uh, the, from a technical standpoint isn't as important right but uh, there's um it, as you go forward in life like the more you know there, there is a very uh there is success along a technical path right um but i would say there's uh there's a lot of people are rewarded really well um for building success uh with other people right so um you know, whether it's leading organizations, you know, having, you know, be able to lead a pyramid, a team is, um, you know, it's more rewarding, uh, you know, from a career and financial standpoint, right, than kind of being a, a one person, right? Because your magnitude, you can't amplify what you do. And actually, your, the, the last question that the student asked about um, encouraging brothers to be the chapter leadership. Um, I think that could relate actually to your role in a lot of the recruiting and hiring of staff. Um, you know, when you're looking at someone's resume or when you're interviewing someone and you hear they're, they are in a fraternity, you know, how does that impact your evaluation of the selection process? Um, whether you see them as a fraternity with no involvement versus a fraternity and they were a leader, or an officer, or a committee chair, does any of that make any uh, impact on your decision making? Yeah, so, so just the fraternity, right? It's like you might as well put in the hobby section, right? Like I dance or whatever, right? <laughs> uh, but the fraternity with leadership, right? That's where you can connect and say, you know, uh, oh, you know, and that, that's where like they would have tried to achieve something, right? And that's where you can connect. Hey, in this role, right? A lot of times when we hire undergrads, they don't have a lot of experience, right? So you have to take these uh, examples uh, whether it's internships or on campus, you say, okay, where is this person demonstrated, you know, ability to lead teams, ability to solve problems, abil ability to deal with challenges, right? So those are the areas where I would typically probe in and say, okay, um, you know, as a leader in this group, right, tell me about this. Um, and that's, that opens up that discussion. Otherwise, yeah, it's, a, it's just a hobby. From a, from a, uh, uh, work and hiring standpoint right so no absolutely but, but it definitely stresses the importance of not just having a fraternity experience but having the meaningful fraternity experience and the, the values and lessons you get out of being able to have that response of what you gained and what differentiated you and uh i think our students that uh, utilize the fraternity experience especially those that are here at the conference um can utilize that when they're uh, going out there to get their first job to say that they've participated in international conferences or they've done these different types of things and so um, I hope it'll continue to be valuable for them. Yeah, like all these uh, conferences that I went to as an undergrad, right? They still stick in my head, right? Um, not on Zoom, right? But they were they were good events that left an image. <laughs> <laughs>
And I think that's, you know, you need a lot of those things to kind of help build you and propel you. Absolutely. Well, here's that uh, about hits our time now. And um, so I just wanted to conclude by, you know, once again, thanking you for your um, participation and joining and leading us down this path. Uh, really appreciated your, your four points of the, the self motivations, challenging the status quo, uh, persuasive communication, the successful relationships. I, I really feel that those all definitely uh, resound with our student members and mm -hmm. something they can take away right now um, as they uh, propel their life forward. So, really do appreciate that. You're good. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks everyone for listening. And uh, have great success in your college years. Well, thank you again so much, Harris, for your time tonight. And uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, joining the Pike University Conference. And uh, please don't forget to do the eval that Sam just posted. Uh, enjoy the rest of the sessions we have tonight. Thank you so much. And we we'll look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye, Pike, brothers. Thank you.